Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. We are in a section of Ezekiel called the Judgment of God. And the specific section that we are in right now is Jerusalem's sin is comprehensive. And we're uh, picking up in, uh, in Ezekiel chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. Okay. Pull my laptop over here a little bit so I can see it. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, And you, son of man, will you judge? Will you judge the bloody city? Then declare to her all her abominations. You shall say, thus says the Lord God, a city that sheds blood in her midst so that her time may come and that makes idols to defile herself. You have become guilty by the blood that you have shed and defiled by the idols that you have made and you have brought your days near. The appointed time of your years has come. Therefore, I have made you a reproach to the nations and a mockery to the countries. Those who are near and those who are far from you will mock you. Your name is defiled. You are full of tumult. So God then asks one of his uh, rhetorical, I guess my pictures are not lined up right, are they? Sorry. Is that better? How about that? That's better. Okay. That's better. Sorry. Mm -hmm. That's okay. I wasn't paying attention. That's all right. God asks Ezekiel some uh, rhetorical questions along the way. And he, in this case, he asks Ezekiel if he'll judge the bloody city. Similar to what he asks in, in chapter 20, verse 4. It appears to me that what Ezekiel or what God is doing with Ezekiel is he was placing Ezekiel in a position where he kind of had to act as the prosecuting attorney who would then, you know, take things to the, to the grand jury and then make it public. We have an indictment against so-and-so. Well, God is telling Ezekiel, you have an indictment. You have an indictment against Israel. You have an indictment against Judah. And then Ezekiel would have to declare all the sins of Jerusalem and Judah publicly. Ezekiel's... The more I study Ezekiel, the more I think of this, this poor guy. He really got a raw deal from God in, in a lot of ways, it seems like, from our vantage point. You know, he spent his entire youth and early adult life preparing to be a priest, only to be ripped away from the temple, never having served as a priest. And then God tells him, well, you're going to be my prophet. Well, that's kind of cool, God. I'll do that. Oh, by the way, they're going to hate what you say. They're never going to accept what you say. They're never going to like it. And I think, oh, man, he just didn't get a fair deal. Seemingly. I'm not saying God was unfair. I'm saying from <laughs> his. The charges God was giving to Ezekiel to declare publicly were that Jerusalem had shed blood and had worshipped idols. <laughs> Sins that were in direct opposition to what Israel had said they would do or wouldn't do. Direct opposition to the, to the covenant they had with God. Direct opposition to the law that God gave them through Moses, that they had agreed they would follow. Rather than following and loving Jehovah God, they followed false gods right from the beginning. This wasn't anything new. God had a lot of patience. I mean, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're, how many years are we? We're, uh, we're 1,400 years of Israel by this time. That's a lot of patience. God, God had a lot of patience, and Israel and Judah and Jerusalem never got it. They began to follow the false gods of, of the pagans around them. Bloodshed is, a, is, I believe, a reference to human sacrifice. It's, it's a sociological thing 
that we don't understand because it never has been really part of our sociological background. But that's not true for the tribal peoples in much of the world. Western Europe hasn't had that as a, as a thing for you know six, 700 years. But the rest of the world still looks at, at human sacrifice as a, as a real thing, as a legitimate thing in certain cases. I mean, we, we, we talk about it frequently um, when Islam, when a, when a dad in Islam finds his daughter out with a uh, non-Muslim, according to Sharia law, he has the right to kill her. That, that only is permissible in the mind because of the idea that human sacrifice is a thing. It doesn't work in our consciousness because it's not a thing for us. So understand, we have a completely different worldview. So, and, Rick? Yeah. So, under that mind, that worldview that says human sacrifice is okay, do they then approve of abortion? Well, I was reading about abortion and uh, Islam the other day. Um, the woman does not have the right to abort. The man does. The man, yeah. Mm -hmm. The man can tell her to abort. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Un understand that Western Europeans have adopted or have stuck closer to the biblical idea of the sanctity of life than any other people group in the world. And of course, we're all Western Europeans. Mm -hmm. um, the, the tribals from South America, obviously the uh, sanctity of life is not a big thing. The Far East, uh, I mean, obviously in China, sanctity of life is not a thing. Um, and and the, the, the Islamic peoples and the Arab peoples, not that they're the same, um, the sanctity of life is not, not a real thing. So really the only group that has remained true to the biblical idea remained truer, not true, remained truer to the biblical idea is Western Europeans. When you study, when you study world history from the sociological standpoint, there's some fascinating things in the development of nations and where, where the United States predominantly came from. And to think that the United States is not the product of God's direction is is only possible if you believe that God didn't create the universe. Mm -hmm. In other words, you have to you have to believe that that life is not important. Mm -hmm. And the the Western Europeans that formed the United States still held to the principle that it was. And so that's a that's been a that's been a fiber in our in the American DNA since the beginning. despite what the liberal left wants to say today. I was reading an article, what is today, Wednesday, Sunday night, on the three-fifths clause in the Constitution. What? There, there is a clause in the Constitution that Black people only were valued at a rate of three-fifths of a human being. For census and so forth. Read the Constitution. Yes. Um, and, and the liberal left today wants to say that's because of the founders being, being racist. Well, if you really want to dig into it, they did that to protect black people so that the South wouldn't have the votes to be able to make slavery nationwide. Just have to study it. But that's how thing, it has been part of our DNA in America for that long. And it's not the rest of the world. So just when, when we read like here in Ezekiel that, uh, that God is charging them with, with uh, human sacrifice, we, we, we're revolted by it, but the rest of the world is not because it's part of the way they do business. And so it revolted God 
it's not the standard God set, but the nations that came out of the rest of the world didn't hold to the, to the biblical principle, to the godly principle of the sanctity of life. That's why the United States is such a lighthouse. That's why Western Europe for a long time has been such a lighthouse, because we do or did hold to that. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox. Sorry. I shouldn't read at night. That's the problem. So when, when we talk about human sacrifice, we can go to like 2 Kings 17. And they burned their sons and their daughters as offerings and used divination and omens and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to rang, anger. They sold or they burned their sons and their daughters as offerings. Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. None was left but the tribe of Judah only. So that is, that is a concept that really is frustrating to us. It's frustrating to God, but not everybody responds the way we do. All, this, all the nations around Israel performed human sacrifice. It was, it was, they were just doing what their neighbors did. They were keeping up with the Joneses, as it were. As a result of the hypocrisy of Jerusalem, the city was the object of scorn and ridicule. I, I go back to uh, to verse twenty, uh, to verse five of uh, Ezekiel twenty-two. Those who are near and those who are far from you will mock you. Your name is defiled. You are full of tumult. Now let's talk. Uh, Sybil said something the other night when she was here. The world hates Jews. Why? Because they do the same as them when they were supposed to not to. Huh? Everyone has a background idea that the Jews were not supposed to be like them. And because they acted like them, they mocked them. Oh, I see. That, that's true in this passage. But I think why do, why do people in the United States today, by and large, why is anti-Semitism on such a rise today? Oh, we lost Nancy. Here she comes back. Why is anti-Semitism on the rise today? Because the country is more anti-God than they were years ago. They have no no respect for for Christians or Jews or any you know anybody that follows God or pretends to. I think this verse is the answer to the question. Those who are near and those who are far from you will mock you. Your name is defiled. You are full of tumult. I think anti-Semitism is part of the punishment of Israel for violating the violating God's covenant with Israel. God tells Ezekiel right here, or Ezekiel tells uh, the leaders right here, you're going to be mocked for who you are. Israel was no better than the rest. They were doing the same things as the people around them. And God said to them, you're going to be mocked by everybody around you. Every, even people that aren't around you. They're going to mock you. I think it's part of God's judgment on Israel. Now, what happens at the end of the tribulation in the millennial kingdom? Crickets. <laughs> They're going to rule and reign with with um, Jesus over the rest of the world. Yeah, I I I, I uh, phrase it as they'll be the first among equals. They will have a different relationship with the King of the Universe than the rest of the world, and they'll be just a little bit closer to Him than the rest of the world. So all of this scorn, all of this mocking will be reversed 
when he's their king. You see, I think this is all part of the punishment. Obviously, anti-Semitism is sin. It's been there for a long, long time. But why is it there? You see, sociologically, it doesn't make sense. But it makes sense if God is, is orchestrating just as he said he would. Or as he said would take place. Just, a, uh, just an extra thought there that I think that anti-Semitism grows out of God's judgment on Israel for their violation of the covenant that they multiple times agreed they would uh, they would support and follow. That is a very heavy thought. Yeah, it is. That's not and, and but that's what Ezekiel is. Ezekiel is very yeah. heavy, and there's a there's an awful lot of of Ezekiel that gives us insight into the future. And I think into the present as well. As we see anti-Semitism growing all across the all across the world. For for why? What has Israel done to anybody? Well, it's also jealousy, they're the apple of God's eye. Not right now. They dare yeah, but, to take but the Satan life. knows and he's behind it. No. Right. Right. Yes. If if you if you look at the electronics that you have in your possession today, most of it would not operate if it were not for the modern Israel. Mm -hmm. Yep. Most of the control surfaces in your car would not operate if it were not for modern Israel and their their design of many of the electronic circuits that. Uh, that we have in our radios and our phones and our computers and so forth. They're not all built there, obviously, but they are designed by, by Israel. Israel has provided more to, you know, we, we say that Jesus is the blessing that Israel uh, brings to the world, but Israel brings a lot more than just, not just Jesus, more than, than Jesus. Much of our modern world is because of modern Israel. And yet, the world by and large hates Israel. It doesn't make sociological sense. But it makes biblical sense. Okay, well, I'll stop. The, another thing is, is that they dared to take back land that was theirs. And of course, that obviously angered a whole group, people group. Did they do any different than anybody else? No, but it still angered a whole people group. Right. And, and so sociologically, it doesn't make sense. People were angry only because it was Israel. People weren't angry with what Assyria did, unless you lost your land. People weren't angry with Alexander the Great. You know, people living in, in Des Moines, Iowa today aren't, angry at Alexander the Great for conquering uh, Spain to India. But Israel taking a little piece of dirt that God had promised to them, they're angry about. Why? Because God said that they would be, they would be defiled and they would be uh, uh, scorned and, and so forth. I was just thinking of modern day Israel and the yeah. refugees and so sure. forth. That's why people are angry now. Is there still a grudge because uh, the Falkland Islands? No. <laughs> so it, you see, it doesn't make sociological sense. It's just an excuse people use because they don't know why they're angry with Israel. Why is the liberal left in the United States always angry with Israel? Half of them are Jewish because that's what they want to do. Because they're being led. As Sybil said, Satan's leading that movement. Okay, on to verse uh, 6. Behold, the princes of Israel in you, every one, according to his power, has been bent on shedding blood. 
Father and mother are treated with contempt in you. The sojourner suffers extortion in your midst. The fatherless and the widow are wronged in you. You have despised my holy things and profaned my Sabbaths. There are men in you who slander to shed blood and people in you who eat on the mountains. They commit lewdness in your midst. In you, men uncover their father's nakedness. In you, they violate women who are unclean in their menstrual impurity. One commits abomination with his neighbor's wife. Another lewdly defiles his daughter-in-law. Another in you violates his sister. Oops, too far. Violates his sister, his father's daughter. In you, they take bribes to shed blood. You take interest and profit and make gain of your neighbors by extortion. But me, you have forgotten, declares the Lord. So here's another count on the indi- or another set of counts on the indictment. In this section, Ezekiel cites the sins God is accusing Judah and Jerusalem of committing. Here's the list: social injustice in verse seven, apostasy in verse eight, idolatry in verse nine. Immortality in verse, verses 10 and 11. Greed in verse 12. Forgot God. Verse 12. The last sin Judah and Jerusalem are accused of appears to be the root of all the other sins. They forgot God. They failed in, the rela- in their relationship with him and didn't follow him. He remained loyal to them but they didn't follow him. God responds to to this indictment, to their forgetting of him. We'll see it in uh, chapter 23, but here's a sneak peek. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have forgotten me and cast me behind your back, you yourself must bear the consequences of your lewdness and whoring. The sins of Israel were the result of Israel's failure to remain loyal to God, the God who brought them out of captivity and gave them to the promised land, gave them the promised land to live in. They failed to live up to their commitment to the law, to the law God had given them. Had they followed him and remained loyal to him, he would have continued to bless them. Remember the remember the deal they made. It's very simple. Follow me, get to stay. Don't follow me, got to go. It was that simple. Well, God's, God's mercy and his patience had run out. So back in chapter 22, Behold, I strike my hand at the dishonest gain that you have made and at the blood that has been in your midst. Can your courage endure or can your hands be strong in the days that I shall deal with you? I, the Lord, have spoken. I will do it. I will scatter you among the nations and disperse you through the countries, and I will consume your uncleanness out of you. And you shall be profaned by your own doing in the sight of the nations, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So God continues speaking through Ezekiel and bringing up the charges against Israel and Judah. In verse 13, God speaks out against the dishonest gain that the people of Israel and Judah have been making. In violating the the law, the, the law that Moses gave them, they were charging interest on loans to other Jews. That was against the law. They could only charge small interest to non-Jews, but there they were making lots of money with uh, loaning money. They also have a, a, a problem of, of, as you go through the, the minor prophets, you'll see it repeated over and over again. They had dishonest scales. You thought you were buying a pound, but you only got 14 ounces, but you had to pay a pound worth. Those kinds of things. God is so angry at the sins of Israel, it's almost like he's banging his hands on the podium saying, I've told you and told you and told you, and you just wouldn't listen. It's coming to an end. Put on your seatbelt. It's going to get rough. 
The people of Israel had promised to follow the laws God had given, yet consistently they violated those laws. God will punish them for their sins, and there is nothing they can do about it. God has spoken, and it will come about, just as he said. In verse 15, God stated that he would scatter the people out of the land. Remember, follow me, obey me, get to stay. Don't, got to go. But they continued to violate the law. They would eventually be removed from the law from the land. God was being consistent with the agreement that they had agreed to. He couldn't not do it. He was obligated to do it. He had to do it. I'm fascinated that he allowed them to go so long. I'm fascinated that he just started to do it at all when he knew it was going to be a failure. Well, we could go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Yeah. With that same I, sentiment. You know, as, as, as a teacher, I rarely started a project that I knew, knew was going to be an absolute failure. I looked for another way to do it. So it wasn't a failure. So it just, you know, that's a part of my makeup that just doesn't make sense. Well, maybe you're looking at it from a teacher and not as a parent. Did you teach Jonathan how to ride his bike or somebody else did? I did. So you knew at some point he was going to fall. <laughs> well, Probably. if you didn't believe he was going to fall, you had more faith in your son than anybody else around him. Yeah, he didn't. Fall. I don't know, even know that he even fell, though. <laughs> he was he was well, fortunate. Well, Molly's on the other hand, that's a different story. <laughs> okay, so so you you pushed them in a bike, knowing mm -hmm. that at some point they're gonna go crash and burn. Yeah. Just like when you let go of them when they're walking. What's gonna happen? They're gonna fall down, they're gonna get hurt. So if you look at it from that standpoint, were you doing the right thing in pushing them down on the bike, pushing them on the bike or letting go of them when they're walking so they could learn how to do it? Now, that's a very simplistic way to look at what God was doing with Israel. But when you, when like God, you can stand at the end of the process and look at how it's all going to come out, there will be tremendous blessing in what they went through and where they end up. And if they hadn't done that and God knew all this in the beginning, we wouldn't be here. Right, right. The, the master plan includes it all. Mm -hmm. God's not responding to their sin. He's responding to his plan. His plan always included their sin. He knew that. So, and us knowing from a, from a, a theological student standpoint, knowing that God planned all this out, how can we look at what we're seeing and see it better from God's vantage point or from a different vantage point than why would God let them do that if he knew they were going to fail? D did it hurt when Caitlin fell on her bike? Yeah. Probably still has some of the scars. But was it something necessary? Absolutely. It's just a different way to look at that. God's not, God's not letting them fail. God's taking them through the next step of, of maturation. It was hard, no doubt about it. But so many people didn't make it. But so many people didn't make it, correct. So we can, we can go all the way back to the foundation of the, of before the foundation of the world. Those that didn't make it weren't going to make it. I know. But that still just blows my mind. Yeah. I'm still wrong with that. It's very frustrating. When you finally wrap your ha head around the complete and total sovereignty of God, it is liberating and it is comforting. It, I understand it and it's liberating, but 
somehow it's not comforting to think about some of the people I know that, I, that they didn't make it and that they spend eternity suffering. Yeah. That's not yeah. Okay. That's true. That, that part is not comforting. But when you, when you recognize the sovereignty of God, you also have to recognize his transcendence and the fact that he actually stands outside of time and space. And so he's not, he's not running to the end of the, of the line to see what happens. Mm -hmm. For him, it's all happened or is happening or is going to happen. It's all in one. It's almost a philosophical singularity for him. And he controls it all. And that makes it so much more comfortable to know that I can't even understand how he exists, let alone the fact that he controls everything and that he's got it right. Yeah. You just have to, you just have to have comfort. Well, probably not the right word. Assurance that those that didn't make it weren't going to make it no matter what. You could yep. have done nothing to change that. Yep. So God is, is punishing Israel for their continued violation of his law, continued violation of the standard that he had set. Israel would be punished for their own sins. We've talked about it in, in the past few weeks. They are suffering for their own sins. That were, those sins were sufficient. But there's also a sense that the compounding of the sins of their fathers is included in the formula. But their own sins would be sufficient. Any questions or further comments? Okay, on to verse 17. And the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, the house of Israel has become dross to me. All of them are bronze and tin and iron and lead in the furnace. They are dross of silver. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have all become dross, therefore, behold, I will gather you into the midst of Jerusalem. As one gathers silver and bronze and iron and lead and tin into a furnace to blow the fire on it in order to melt it, so I will gather you and in my anger and in my wrath, I will put you in and melt you. I will gather you and blow, blow on you with fire of my, the fire of my wrath, and you shall be melted in the midst of it. As silver is melted in a furnace, so you shall be melted in the midst of it. And you shall know that I am the Lord. I have poured out my wrath upon you. I love the picture that uh, is being described here. The, the word in ESV, dross, is the Hebrew word sug. And this word is a, a word that has the, has the sense of moving away. It has, a, it has a root understanding of moving from the core. So when, now let's look at the picture of, of melting... Um, silver to purify it what happens when you when you melt silver the impurity the impurity the separate yeah the impurities separate that becomes dross it moves away from the pure so god says he's going to melt israel move them away from the pure Wow, what a picture that is. How does that happen? How does God move Israel away from the pure? He sends in the Assyrians and the Babylonians. Well, and... Relation, yeah. Right, exactly. He, he sends them in and he, he takes them out of the land. But it doesn't end there, does it? Because they go back to the land, but they're still occupied. When does he gather them back again? Tribulation. Yeah, the, the end of the tribulation. 
I think what we have here in this picture, besides my finger in my eye, what we have in this picture is, is God separating the garbage, the dross, from the pure. And the pure would be him. And so Israel is set on the, they're still his chosen people. But he has chosen to not deal with them right now and to deal with the world through the church. So Israel is up on that proverbial shelf, moved away from the pure. God has basically put them on the garbage heap, like where dross would go for a while. And I think that's what we see in the picture of Israel, beginning, as I've said many times, from 722 until the end of the tribulation, that all includes this, this judgment that Israel is going through. I know that after 70 years after the Babylonian captivity, they got to come back in the land. But they never, they never owned the land again. They, they never had their own, their own determination. They never had their own government. There was a very short period under the Maccabees where they thought they did, but they really didn't. I just, I think this picture that we have here of the dross and what that word really means, I think is so important for us to understand. That God was moving them away from the pure. Of course, that's in keeping with the whole picture that God paints with Israel throughout the Old Testament. The underlying principle of much of the Old Testament and throughout all of Israel's teaching is the separation of holy and unholy, the clean and unclean. Well, they have made themselves unclean and God is removing them. So perfectly in keeping with his character. And the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, say to her, you are a land that is not cleansed or, or rained upon in the day of indignation. The conspiracy of her prophets in her midst is like a roaring lion tearing the prey. They have devoured human lives. They have taken treasure and precious things. They have made many win widows in her midst. God continues giving his indictment against Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. There's some debate about whether God is bringing charges against prophets or princes in this statement. The context would seem to dictate princes is the appropriate word rather than uh, prophet. In this passage, there appear to be five different groups in Israel um, that are being mentioned. Princes, priests, officials, prophets, and finally the people. If the word in verse 25 is prophet, then prophet is listed twice, which appears strange. The NIV and its derivatives have priests in verse 25. Um, the NASB has prophet. The Septuagint Greek translation of the Hebrew scripture uses prophets. So what I'm saying is we're not sure in verse 25, if it's the word prophet or if it's the word priest. Doesn't really make any difference. Both had a responsibility to lead Israel in following God. Both failed. So God is presenting an indictment. And both are indicted by God in this. If the word is prophet, then it's clear God is taking, talking about the many false prophets that worked in and around Israel. These false prophets led Israel to follow false gods and idols. We see this all the time as we're going through the narratives of, of uh, Chronicle and Kings. What, what, what do kings do? They surround themselves with sycophants, with prophets that only prophesy good for them. Obviously, those are not prophets speaking for God, and they should be executed as God will take care of. Not only had these false prophets and or priests led the people away from God, but in doing that, a lot of people died and will die. So think about the blood that's on the hands 
of the false prophets and the priests that failed in their job. Everybody that dies as a result of God's punishment, the blood is on their hands. Because they could have led Israel. Now, I'm going to say this in a, from a vantage point of us, not from the vantage point of God. They could have led Israel in following God. But they didn't. And so for that, they're being punished. Obviously, God's plan worked the way he wanted it to work. But they still have culpability. That's part of God's sovereignty and, and our doing things that makes it difficult for us to comprehend what's going on. To quote Joseph, you meant it for evil, God meant it for good. Same action. How that works, I don't have that figured out yet. So they could have, but they didn't. Okay, chapter, 20, um, chapter 22, verse 26. Her priests have done violence to my law and have profaned my holy things. They have made no distinction between the holy and the common, clean and unclean. Neither have they taught the difference between unclean and clean. They have disregarded my Sabbaths so that I am profaned among them. Her princes in her midst are like wolves, tearing the prey, shedding blood, destroying lives to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have smeared whitewash for them, seeing false visions and divining lies for them. Thus says the Lord God when the Lord has not spoken. The people of the land have practiced extortion and committed robbery. They have oppressed the poor and the needy and have extorted from the sojourner without justice. And I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. Whoa, that's a bad indictment. Therefore, I have poured out my indignation upon them I have consumed, the, consumed them with the fire of my wrath. I have returned their way upon their heads, declares the Lord God. So God moves on in his indictment to speak of, of the priests. He accuses the priests of breaking the law, specifically the law of separation of clean and unclean, holy and unholy. God made it clear throughout the Hebrew scriptures that, it, that clear separation between clean and unclean holy and unholy, has to be maintained. That's what, that's, the majority of the law is focused on that. These statements define what God holds as a basic principle. His holiness and how our sin separates us from him. That's a basic principle. We have violated his character, his character of holiness, and that, that separates him, us from him. The spiritual leadership of Israel failed to lead Israel in following the law, including the Sabbath. And I believe the statement of Sabbath here is not just of the Friday night to Saturday night Sabbath. I believe it's the, the Sabbath principle that includes both the seven-year Sabbath and the, and the, the uh, um, year of Jubilees. Please. They violated all of that. Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. I love this passage. But they rebelled against me and were not willing to listen to me. None of them cast... Um, sorry, that's the wrong one. I put the wrong one in there. Let me read it to you. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But on the seventh day is a day... or uh, On the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God... On it you shall do not do any work, you, your son, your daughter, your male servants, or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. We could continue on then in Leviticus 25. For it is a jubilee, it shall be holy to you. You may eat the produce of the field in this year of jubilee each of you shall return to his property and if you make a sale to your neighbor or buy from your neighbor you shall not wrong one another you shall pay your neighbor according to the number of years after the jubilee and he shall sell according to the number of years for crops 
If the years are many, you shall increase the price. And if the years are few, you shall reduce the price. For it is a number of the crops he is selling to you. You shall not wrong one another, but you shall fear your God, for I am the Lord your God. As I've said several times before, they failed to follow the year of Jubilees. That only happened a couple of times in Israel's history. They failed to do it. Mary, you downloaded the book. Did you enjoy it? I'm not finished yet, but it was very interesting. Yes. It's, it's a different perspective of what happens. Yep. Remember, it's not canonical, but the, the, the uh, book of Jubilees tells Israel's history from the vantage point of the Jubilees. Yep. So Israel failed to do that. And, and what was the purpose of the weekly Sabbath, the seven-year Sabbath, and the 50-year Sabbath? What was God's purpose for that? So to give the to give them and the land a rest and so that they could focus on him. Okay, and, there's more. And to show that they trusted him to provide. Exactly. So imagine that the Sabbath year begins and then butts right up to a Jubilee year. So now the food that you grew in the last year before the Sabbath year had to last you for three years. Yep. You had to trust God. Tomorrow, go to the grocery store and buy your groceries that will last for three years. Let me know how that works out for you. <laughs> you, had to you have to trust God for that. And that's what God wanted. God also was establishing that they didn't own the land. God owned the land. They had title to it. They had use of it. But every 50 years, it went back to who? They had to pay for the crops growing on it. Notice what God said. Pay for the crops on it. You're not buying the land. You're just buying the produce of it. It's my land. I let you stay. If you do what I tell you, if you don't do what I tell you, you're out. And Jubilee and Sabbath was all done as part of that process of trusting him and depending on him for everything. They didn't do it well. They did it very poorly. Rich, okay, that brings us, go ahead. Is there someplace, for some reason in my head, I'm thinking there was someplace besides Ezekiel where it says, who will stand in the gap for me? Is there another place in the Bible where that's talked about? And someone yes. says, I will stand in the gap? Yes, but I, I'd have, I have to look that up. I, I don't know off the top of my head. Linda's probably busy doing that right now because she's like the, she's like the, uh, um, oh, I can't even think of the word now. Concordance? Concordance. Concord. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. Isn't it in Joshua? No, I, I want to say it's in Isaiah, but I couldn't find it real quick when I used uh, Google. Well, when you first asked the question, Isaiah is what popped into my mind, but I don't know that. Well, okay, at least I'm not totally, totally a mess. I just kept thinking there must be someplace else. What's today's date? 14. Okay. <laughs> Any questions or anything like that? Well, you guys haven't asked a lot of questions tonight. I had to do a lot of speaking because you weren't asking questions. It's too busy writing. Excuse me? Too busy writing. Yes. Oh, you're too busy writing. Okay. My Bible has will never look the same. No, that's good. A Bible that looks pristine after you've had it for a couple of weeks is no good. Well, it looks like the Murrays put the kid to bed, so they're gone. So if we have no other questions, Linda, did you find your answer yet? I found a whole list of references, but not, not the exact quote yet. I'm still looking. Okay. I, I Mary, if I, find, if I find it, I'll text you. Thank you. I'm working on it as well. Bible. Okay. I don't know why it's bugging me, but it's in my head somewhere. 
I gotta get my yeah. other Bible out, so I'll get it out when we're done. I'm not seeing anything under stand in the gap or standing in the gap. Yeah, or, I'm not even uh, except a brain fart. <laughs> Ezekiel 2230, that's the only one that comes up when I do a quick Google search. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it must be a brain fart on my part. Or it's the same meaning with different terminology, that but using a different I word for it. Look up Second Chronicles. Uh, oh, it doesn't have the verses. Second Chronicles 2031. 2031? 28 through 31. It, it's not a ver it's not a chapter in verse it's it's 28 through 31 chapters yeah the only other one that comes up is isaiah 6 8 and that's that's not quite it so anyway yes in the psalm there's one stood in the breach before him yeah that's what i just found too yep like i said i was probably a misthink in my head happens a lot that's how come i chase rabbits or squirrels yeah we don't chase rabbits around here we chase hippopotami <laughs> okay whatever whatever animal we chase that's why i was in the apocrypha the other day i was ch chasing a hippopotamus thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from friendship Grace brethren church Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.